Welcome to the Wear, Wag, Repeat podcast. I'm Tori Mystic, here with my dogs, Lucy and Bert. Together, we're interviewing cool, creative women entrepreneurs in the pet industry. Do you dream of working alongside your dog? Then sit, stay, and listen to the latest episode to find the inspiration and resources that will help you grow your own dog-inspired business. This episode is full of so much great info for any dog mom. Today's guest is an author and also a dog trick evaluator who has some really cool ideas on new tricks that you can teach your dog to create a stronger bond with them or even make them into an Instagram star. We also talk about how her work can assist in therapy dog programs, from reading to children to showing off tricks for seniors. Oh, and if you're interested in getting your brand featured in dog magazines, she has advice for that too. Sassafras Lowry is an award-winning author and certified trick dog instructor. Her books have been honored by organizations ranging from the American Library Association to the Lambda Literary Foundation. She writes regularly for national and local dog magazines and has published nine books of her own, including three just for dog owners, including the newest, Tricks in the City. After many years in New York City, Sassafras now lives and writes in Portland, Oregon, alongside her partner, three cats, and three dogs of dramatically different sizes, who all train in a variety of canine sports from agility to tricks. Hi, Sassafras. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to have you here. First of all, I love your name. Thank you. <laughs> Must get that all the time. It's, it's, it's a pretty fun name. It makes me memorable. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, um, tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know that um, you just recently this year have published three books specific to dogs, but you've been writing about dogs for a long time. So, how did you decide to kind of get into the book world? Yeah, so um, I've been writing uh, as a freelance writer for dog publications for well over a decade now, uh, and writing and publishing. Uh, books on a variety of other subjects from fiction to nonfiction, but I hadn't ever done a dog book and realized that absolutely needed to change. Uh, so it just so happened with publishers' schedules and everything else that I ended up with uh, three very different, very fun dog books uh, releasing in 2019. So tell us about the three books that came out this year. What, what are they all about? Yeah, so the first one is called Healing Healing, H-E-A-L-I-N-G slash H-E-E-L-I-N-G. <laughs> um, and it is a, a poetic lyric essay hybrid uh, book that is sort of chronicling um, some of my journey working uh, with dogs starting as a junior handler uh, when I was a teenager through um, some pretty traumatic experiences. And sort of the central piece is my relationship with dogs and dog sports. And so using course maps from agility and rally and different sports on the page as part of sort of these lyric essays. And then uh, the second book is actually a picture book. It's uh, the first in a series uh, of bedtime stories for rescue dogs. And it's, uh, so it's picture book for dogs uh, in partnership with the amazing illustrator, Lily Chin of Dog Drawings. Uh, and it's called William to the Rescue. And it is the story of a uh, Chinese crested whose mom has to go on a business trip and he needs to rescue her. That sounds uh, horrible. <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, and then the third book uh, released from Mango Press in uh, August, and it's called Tricks in the City for Daring Dogs and the Humans Who Love Them. And it is a very fun instructional book looking at dog tricks, how to teach them, and uh, how those can be, how tricks can be useful uh, for a variety of things from building confidence to making your dog a star. <laughs> Well, I definitely want to know more about that, but I have so many questions now. <laughs> These books just all sound so different, like you said, but so interesting. And I think it sounds like kind of the common thread, maybe apart from, from William to the Rescue, but the common thread sort of seems like um, dog agility and tricks and training are, are, are such a passion of yours. How, do, how long have you been doing that? And, um, you know, what, what do you still do now? I, I know that you still compete with your different dogs. I don't really know that much about agility and trick competitions. 
Yeah. So I started, started uh, training dogs uh, when I was a teenager, so over 20 years ago, uh, and competed very heavily in agility um, when I was in high school. And really then as an adult, transitioned into a different sport. Uh, I still play around with agility, though I don't compete. Uh, and my current dogs compete in tricks. My two youngest are champion trick dogs. Um, and we do a little bit of parkour competition. We do a little bit of rally competition. So really dog training, uh, is a big fun part of how I spend time with my dogs. Yeah. This is so cool. So like I, now I want to go to like a trick competition because it sounds so cool. Like what kind of tricks do you guys do? Yeah. So one of the really great things about tricks as a sport is it's probably, I think it's the best intro sport for anyone and it's a really versatile sport. So there's two different main um, venues of competition. The first is the the oldest, which is Do More With Your Dog, and that's the organization that I'm certified through um, to observe trick dog titles for other people. Uh, so I can, and one of the great things is that it can be done via video. So it's one, it's really, really accessible. People are able to actually record videos of their dogs in the, out in the world, in their yard, in their home, wherever, doing a variety of tricks at different levels. So there's novice, intermediate, advanced, expert, and then the champion level. Oh. Uh, and, and they can earn titles from anywhere. So it's very accessible, no matter you know where you live geographically, for folks who have dogs who might be special needs or reactive. This is a venue that dogs can really shine in. That is so cool. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, one of my dog friends here, um, she has trained her dog to ring this bell, like a, like a bell you would have at like a reception desk. Yeah. He rings that bell like 40 times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> is that something that she could submit to a competition like this? It is. So that actually, so like ringing like a little like desk bell like that is one of the tricks, um, that would be recognized at the expert level. So oh, if she wow. wanted, so if she wanted to get involved, um, she actually could use it towards her novice title. So you have to earn your novice, intermediate, advanced, and then you're your expert. But okay, you it's can, like karate. But, you have to work your exactly. way up. Exactly. <laughs> you work your way up, but you can use more advanced tricks at the earlier level also, and they count for a few more points. Um, oh, so cool. She's well on her way. I love it. We're going to have a champion trick dog here in Pittsburgh, and we didn't even know it. <laughs> exactly. So, okay, so that's very cool. And so um, yeah. that's kind of been like, sounds like the underlying theme of a lot of stuff that that you've been working on yeah absolutely dogs are sort of the the central thing in my life and they uh, they, they make their presence known pretty much in all my work that's wonderful and and I was just before we hit record I was actually scoping out um some of your stuff online and I was I was looking up um the William to the Rescue book that you wrote the the picture book for dogs yep um, and I was, it was so interesting. You were talking about like all the different benefits and the different usages for this book. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I actually got the idea, uh, to, to do this book project several years ago, uh, when my middle dog, Charlotte, who is a former street dog, very special needs rescue came home. Uh, and one of the things that I did with her was read storybooks to her, to calm her down when she was stressed. She has a lot of various anxiety issues that we work through. Uh, and I realized I wasn't the only person that did it. I talked to other people who read books to their dogs. And then there are also a variety of programs where kids read to dogs to gain literacy. Right. Um, and so there's all these things. And I was like, but there's not really a lot of, at least that I had seen at the time, books that were for dogs. And I was like, we got to change this. So that was... <laughs> That was the the inspiration behind uh, bedtime stories for rescue dogs. So, what makes it different? Like, what makes it for dogs, uh, especially different than like than any other book? Yeah. So the the sort of the, the key difference is the the dog. You know, really is the protagonist. It's a story that sort of is from the dog's point of view. Though I have heard from a variety of uh, folks in the world that their small children are also quite fans of the book. So <laughs> it, it, it is flexible in that way. I love that. And then do you, have you like ever heard, I'm just wondering like if reading like in different voices, like for different characters or like making different noises adds any kind of experiential element to reading to your dog? 
I mean, I think that anecdotally people and their dogs have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, and I've, you know, I've definitely heard of programs happening of folks reading to, to dogs over 4th of July and other high stressful situations, you know, our voices in all of their, you know, are, are really comforting to dogs. And so, you know, I think it, it makes sense that reading to them would also bring comfort. Yeah. And like maybe like have a, a treat after every page or something like that. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that all dogs would sign on to that. That idea. That would definitely help a lot. So, okay. Having your dogs around, like I work alongside my dogs all the time and it can be kind of difficult to get things done <laughs> because <laughs> they, you know, I have two dogs, you have three, you know, they need a lot of attention and, you know, I go above and beyond and do all sorts of things for them. So how do you, do you have any recommendations? How do you structure your time? Because, you know, putting out three books on top of, I'm sure plenty of other work that you're doing. Do you have any recommendations for getting all of this stuff done? Yeah. Working with dogs is fun. They're the cutest coworkers and they can also be the biggest distracting coworkers you yes. can imagine <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah. I think, you know, for me, I do have three dogs um, that range from uh, my oldest will be 17 years old next. Uh, he'll be 17 years old when this airs oh. uh, and is 10 pounds. And my youngest is over a hundred pounds and is two and a half years old. So and then my middle one is nine and 50 pounds. So we have a lot of energy. And we, <laughs> for me, you know, because I, I'm so, I feel so lucky. I get to write full time. Uh, I write for dog magazines and then the books. Uh, and I spend all my day with my dog. So we really structure our day. We walk in the morning. Then I write for a little while. Then we do usually do some training, uh, play some games. They're tired again. I write for a little while. We take an afternoon walk then I write again. So I really try to sort of jump back and forth between spending quality time with them, meeting their needs, uh, and getting, hitting my deadlines. Yeah. I think that's such a great idea to do like some tricks or some training or different stuff in the middle of the day. Cause you know, going on walks is really great. And that's like one kind of exercise, yeah. but exercising their minds and you know, you can do it from like, just, you can just be in the living room. You don't even have to like leave the house. <laughs> exactly. Mental exercise is huge. You know, it's, it's so rewarding for dogs and especially, yeah, you know, it is, can be just as or more tiring um, in a good way than physical exercise and is perfect for when weather is, you know, not ideal for going right. outside. Right. Well, so I have to ask you a question with, as a multiple dog owner, mm -hmm. or dog mom, um, when you do training, do you have to separate the dogs or do you, you have some kind of trick for doing training with them all in one space? That's a great question. So it is, it's not something that can happen overnight for sure. And it, you know, it can't always happen depending on the, you know, configuration of, of your dog family. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do train uh, all my dogs at the same time. We do a lot of uh, boundary training. So they're getting highly, the dogs that are not actively, you know, doing whatever we're working on are getting highly rewarded for holding down stays on a bed or mm -hmm. a mat. So they're all actually working at the same time and getting rewarded for that. There just might not be, you know, the dog who is, you know, learning how to push a tiny shopping cart or, or what have you. <laughs> Okay, the tricks that you guys are working on at lunchtime are very different than the tricks that we're working on at lunchtime. It's hard to find dog mom gear that fits in with the rest of your style. I love my dogs, but I don't want paw prints on everything I own. The Wear Wag Repeat Shop is full of artist designed apparel, handmade accessories for you and your dog, and stylish gifts for the dog obsessed. Best-selling products from the Wear, Wag, Repeat shop, like our Puppy Breath Candle, have been featured on blogs like Proud Dog Mom and the Daily Dog Tag. Your dog is already spoiled, so treat yourself. Get 15% off your first order when you visit shop.wearwagrepeat.com and use promo code PODCAST. That's shop.wearwagrepeat.com, promo code PODCAST. So I know that trick, like you mentioned that we started talked about at the beginning of the episode, that trick training is, is sort of a, a growing sport. Um, and this book, this new book that you have out tricks in the city outlines tons of different tricks from 
practical ones, I'm, I'm assuming, like sitting and yep. staying at a, as a, at a busy cafe or something like that. Yep. Kind of more fun tricks. So what would you say are some of like the, the standout tricks in that book? I know there's many, many, many in there, but if you could pick like three that someone would teach their dog, what would you pick? Ooh, that's a great question. So I really tried when I put the book together. Um, I did live in New York City for over a decade with dogs. And so I tried to pick tricks that could be done in any space without a lot of really expensive or really big equipment or accessories, um, because that's just not practical for a lot of people. So I think really cool standout tricks that don't require sort of a lot of expensive apparatus are um, there is a scratch art trick. So you can actually, you know, teach your dog how to make uh, the scratch art and then also like a painting with markers doesn't have to be messy. So your dog can make cool art, abstract art for your house or that you can gift to people. Those are two of my favorites. (laughs) It's very fun. I love those. And then, um, you know, I think a a huge favorite of my dogs that's always a standout um, is basketball. You can get tiny little basketball hoops like at the dollar store really inexpensive don't take a lot of space and everybody's always really impressed when a dog can then you know take a ball in their mouth and go put it in a a tiny little basketball hoop it's yeah I, 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 I'm like, that's kind of related. I've been wanting to train my dogs to put their toys away. (laughs) Nice. Yep. And that would be a very similar trick. Yes. Yes. And putting your toys away. Absolutely. Uh, one of the tricks in this book, teaching your dog to identify different toys so you can tell them which toys to go put away. Yeah. Very fun. Yeah. This is also impressive. I cannot wait to dive in and, and start working on some new tricks because it's just fun. It's fun. You know, I, I take my one dog, Lucy, she's a therapy dog and we go volunteer at the local veteran center and almost everyone there is in a wheelchair. It's, um, pretty older crowd. Um, and, and Lucy does a great job. She likes to just sit next to them. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard for people physically to, even if they're sitting there, it's hard for them to reach out and pet her. I've been noticing there's just a a lot of limitations. So I like to kind of get her in the middle of a group and have her do a few little tricks and she does not know very much, (laughs) but they're always impressed by doing a down stay and I'll, I'll put some, a treat on the floor and make her stay and wait for it for like 30 seconds. They're very impressed by that (laughs) or, you know, just shaking paws. Yes. Something like that and rolling over or doing a spin or something like that. And I think if I could teach her a few other cute little things, it would really add a lot more to her therapy dog work. Absolutely. Tricks are such a great sort of add on for, for therapy dogs who are doing such important work in the community and it, people love it. Like it, I don't think anybody can watch a dog doing a trick, no matter how complicated it is and not smile. Like it, it's just cute and it's fun and the dogs are having fun and it doesn't get better than that. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I'm, this is, you're inspiring me. I'm going to actually really work on this. <laughs> yeah. Yay. So I want to talk more. Um, so, so you've written, you know, several books and mm-hmm. um, some about dogs, some not about dogs. Um, but I'm so interested also in your freelance writing work because that must just be exciting to to see your work in magazines that are being published on a regular basis and that you can buy at Barnes and Noble or wherever. Um, how, do, how do you go about um, creating those relationships uh, and finding those kind of opportunities? Yeah, freelance writing is great. You know, it is definitely, you know, what enables me to spend my day working, you know, at home with my dogs. And, um, you know, I got started and my you know, definite advice for people getting started was, you know, looking at smaller local publications, um, you know, that are dog focused or pet focused, if that's sort of the industry you want to break into, uh, and reaching out to them, you know, it's a lot easier to break into, um, freelancing with local publications oftentimes. Uh, and then you can build up a portfolio, um, of published work and then start building, you know, reaching out to and building relationships with editors, um, at at bigger national publications over time. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, so, how how far in advance do um, do you have to write things? Like you know, I always see like fashion magazines or something. They've got to shoot 
all their holiday stuff in like June and they're wearing <laughs> ski outfits at the beach or something like that. Um, so is it kind of similar for dog magazines? Do you have to write stuff like six months in advance? Yeah, it, it is actually really similar. So um, I write for you know a variety of magazines from The Bark and Hold Dog Journal and Dogster. And um, they're all very different publications. But one of the similar things is, yeah, if, in terms of writing for print, it is a very long lead time. I'm about to file a story next week that's going to be um, for the December issue. And this is, we're recording this in July. So it is really about a six month lead time on pieces, um, which can be tricky and exciting, but also very fun when then you just see them out in the world months and months later. Yeah, well, yeah, it's like a, a delayed, it's almost like a surprise. Like yes. <laughs> for, for me, when I do things that far in advance, when they actually come out, I'm like, Ooh, I forgot about that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When the magazine like hits my mailbox or I see it, you know, in, in a bookstore and I'm like, Oh, right. I forgot I wrote that. Um, <laughs> because by the time it comes out, I've written, you know, dozens of other articles. Uh, and so it's always very fun when I, when it, I get to see it. All so months later. A lot of the people who listen to this show um, are small business owners. Um, some of them have their own dog products or um, they're bloggers or just, all, I mean, all sorts of different dog mompreneurs are listening here. Um, yeah. So if someone was interested in getting their business or their work or, you know, their, their shelter, the rescue that they help out featured in one of these magazines, like what would that process be like? Do they reach out to the writer or do they reach out to the magazine? That's, that's a good question. Yeah, it really goes back to the magazine. So the, mm -hmm. the magazine and the magazine editors are really who are generally um, setting the editorial calendar. They're deciding what's going to be covered. Uh, there are exceptions to that. I do a lot of and most freelance writers do a lot of pitching um, to our editors of stories we would like to write, though that tends to be less about, you know, somebody reaching out to us and more like there's a news item that's happening that relates to dogs. And I'm going to email my editor and say, hey, can we get ahead of this story and cover it online or for the magazine? And th those, again, generally more online tend to be able to happen because the, they're not functioning under the same six month lead mm -hmm. uh, as print does. It's hard to, for those, mag, you know, to, from, to pitch stories to magazines that have, you know, sort of a immediate news item to them. But mm -hmm. yeah, I would say, you know, if folks are trying to get, you know, their business covered would be to connect directly to the magazines. Yeah. Okay, great. Very interesting. Um, now I'm kind of just got my wheels turning here and thinking about all the different stories that you've covered, it has to have been a lot. Is there any story that sticks out to you as, I don't know, being, being the most significant or the most moving in some way? Ooh, that's a real, that's, it's tricky. Um, you know, I feel so <laughs> Sorry, I lucky. I put you on the spot. <laughs> um, oh God, I really love everything that I get to write. Um, I do two that sort of stand out in this, I would say in the last year. Can I, can I do that? Can I do the last yeah, year? Yeah, you can, yeah, um, you have to pick one. I woo! know it's, it's really hard. It's hard because uh, I, I do, I do write full time. So I write a lot of stories from health pieces to behavior pieces to sort of news items. I think that, you know, um, a story that really stands out to me is I wrote a feature story for the spring issue of the Bark magazine that was looking at, um, dot com sort of like the app based dog walking oh, companies yes. mm -hmm. and the a lot of the challenges and dangers um and the number of dogs that have been lost or injured or killed yes. sort of with dog care providers who really aren't necessarily trained so that felt like really sad but also really exciting and important piece to be able to write um yeah, difficult to cover but very important yeah Absolutely. So that was really exciting to me. And then I wrote a story for uh, Dogster magazine, uh, looking at a new homeless shelter for people in Montreal, Canada, uh, that is dog friendly um, and pet friendly. So people who are experiencing homelessness who have pets can actually bring their pets with them to shelter um, and everybody can get their needs met. So that was also a really... Um, Oh, that is so wonderful. I remember years ago, I was at a dog conference and someone was working on um, getting some kind of like legislature or law passed or something like that um, to 
to set up um, like temporary dog. I don't want to call it a dog shelter because the people wouldn't give up ownership of their dogs. But yeah. Temporary dog housing next to, um, you know, homeless shelters or, um, you know, women's centers yes. or things like that because they, and I, and that like really opened my eyes to a lot of things because they were saying, you know, a lot of, this was specific to women. Yep. There was, there's a lot of stats that a lot of women don't leave abusive relationships because they don't want to leave the dog behind and no shelter will take the dog. Um, and they're worried for the dog's safety if they leave them behind. And there's, it's just such a complicated issue. So, um, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, it was amazing. And it's, you know, it remains a complicated issue in a lot of communities and it's similar, you know, it's both an issue for like domestic violence shelters and also general population shelters. Many, many people understandably won't um, go into shelter because it would mean having to surrender their dogs. And so- Yeah, I mean, that's like choosing life or death. That's such a yeah. difficult decision. Yeah, so people live on the streets because they, they want to stay with their dogs, understandably. Uh, and so it's really very cutting edge for, for shelters to start to shift the services they're able to provide in order to really meet the needs of people um, yeah. and their dogs. Well, this is so awesome. It, it's just really wonderful that you're able to write on such topics that um, that really make a difference, like these two that you mentioned. But then also to complement that with, um, you know, more lighthearted things. Like I just yeah. love the bedtime stories and tricks in the city, which just kind of like bring some fun and love to the whole human dog relationship. That's the goal. That's the goal. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so tell everyone where they can find, where can they order these books? Yep. So the books are available. Um, they may be in your local bookstore. Books, brick and mortar bookstores, unfortunately, are, are becoming a dying yes. breed. So they Good may be there, <laughs> unfortunately. Otherwise, on Amazon, uh, you can get them or online through your favorite um, indie bookstore. Awesome. And then where can everyone find you if they want to track you down somewhere online? Yeah. So my website is sassafraslowry.com and I'm guessing it's going to be written somewhere. In the it will be. The yes. On <laughs> wherewagrepeat.com, the show notes or if whatever podcast player you're, you're listening to this on, um, you can find that if you don't want to have to spell it. <laughs> I, I can spell it. It's really long. That was why I did it. So it's S A S A S S A F R A S L O W R E Y uh, dot com. I'm also on pretty much every social media platform. Um, again, under Sassafras Lowry and on YouTube uh, as Introvert Circus. Yeah, and check out her YouTube channel because I have fun watching some videos and some tricks and stuff on there too. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Sassafras. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Wear, Wag, Repeat podcast. You can fetch show notes at wearwagrepeat.com. If you like what you hear, please hit subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And until next time, we'll see you around the dog park. <laughs>